It's looking like our whole waiting room has joined us. Good evening, families. Uh, thank you for joining us and welcome to tonight's session of Ready for Pre-K. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items that we'd like to discuss. As you can see, we're using Zoom for tonight's session. Throughout the session, we will invite you to enter your questions and comments into the question and answer. You are also welcome to unmute, to engage, or ask questions if you feel comfortable. We love hearing our families' voices. This session will be recorded and posted on the DCPS YouTube page. So for that reason, we've turned off the camera feature for guests at this time. If you need tech support during this session, please let us know using the chat function. And so typically we have a Spanish interpreter for this session. It looks like um, they have not joined us yet at this time. So please look forward to um, a future session that will be hosted in Spanish. And we really do apologize for this um, last minute kind of inconvenience. So my name is Lauren Brown. I'm the Director of Family Services for the Early Ch Childhood Education Division, and I will introduce Cheryl Olson. Good evening, everybody. I'm Cheryl. I'm the Deputy Chief of our Early Childhood Division and also a former DCPS teacher and DCPS parent. And I'll kick it over to Robin. Good evening, everyone. My name is Robin Jones. I am the uh, Director of ECE Instruction. And I'm going to pass it to who everyone really wants to talk to, Lauren. Hi, everyone. Lauren Brooks here. So happy to be here with DCE. Thank you all, as always, for the invite. Again, um, I am on the DCPS enrollment team. I am the DCPS lottery specialist and here to answer any questions to make sure everyone is prepared to submit their My School DC lottery applications. All right, so good evening again, everyone. It's, it's really a pleasure to see so many parents on the call this evening. Since you are joining us um, for this session, I assume that you are facing the sometimes challenging and overwhelming process of finding the right pre-K program for your little one. I'm sure that many of you are wondering, where do I start? I know the lottery season has just opened up and with that brings um, all kinds of questions. Where do I start? How do I figure out which pre-K program is right for my child and my family? What does DCPS have to offer? And the most important question, how does the lottery work? I know um, there's gonna be a lot of questions about lottery and uh, we'll get to those questions a little bit later this evening. Uh, while every family is unique and they have different priorities when choosing a pre-K program, we know that all families want their child to be in a program that's safe and that's happy and that prepares their little one for success, not just in kindergarten, but well beyond kindergarten. Um, so for our time together tonight, we're going to address a lot of those questions. We'll talk about our programs, our classrooms, um, and our staff. We'll focus on what, what your child's experience might be like in our pre-K classrooms. And we'll also talk about what makes DCPS's pre-K program unique. You can go ahead to the next one. So here on the slide, you'll see how we'll spend our time together. First, I'll give you an overview of our pre-K program. We'll talk about what's unique about DCPS, including our staff the children's experiences in our classroom, what our curriculum looks like, um, what our classrooms look like, uh, what the daily schedule is like, and the comprehensive programming that we have to offer. Um, and at the end of the session, we'll spend time talking about the lottery questions, and we'll make sure to leave time um, so we can respond to your questions as well. So let's go ahead and jump in. All right. So again, the fact that you're here to us probably means that you already recognize how important pre-kindergarten is. Uh, we know from years and years of research that high quality pre-kindergarten programs can have a significant and lasting impact on children's school readiness and their achievement through school and even their life outcomes. So it's not just all about having a safe and fun place for your children to be during the day, but it really is about making sure that they're starting their schooling on the right foot um, and learning all the basic skills, social emotional skills, language skills that they need so that when they start kindergarten, they are ready to thrive. Um, and so we know that again, it has an impact, not just elementary school, but some studies have shown even all the way through high school graduation. We can go ahead to the next one. 
So you may know this already if you've been following um, any, anything related to early childhood in the district that we really are known throughout the country as a leader in pre-kindergarten programming. Um, DC leads the nation in access to pre-K for both, both three and four-year-olds. That means that we have more pre-K seats for our, for, for our kids um, than any other jurisdiction in the nation. And we have a higher percentage of three-year-olds in particular that attend public pre-kindergarten program. Uh, we also lead the nation in spending on early childhood education as a district. Um, and that really demonstrates the district's longstanding commitment to providing access to high quality early childhood programming for our youngest learners. So the mayor's commitment, the chancellor's commitment all the way through city, city leadership. We can keep going. And here you'll see that it's not just all about access, it's also about quality. So as you can see um, from this quote, because of the district's commitment to high quality pre-K programming, we are also near the top in terms of quality of our classrooms, as you can see from the quotes on the screen. And many of the very best pre-K classrooms in the region can be found right here in DCPS schools. And we can go ahead. All right, so I'll give you just a, a very broad overview of what our pre-K program looks like in DCPS. We do have the largest pre-K program in the district with more than 400 pre-K classrooms that serve more than 5,000 three and four-year-old students. As you can see in this slide, we have several different types of classrooms. Um, we have 136 pre-K three classrooms and that, those classrooms serve our, our very youngest learners starting at the age of three. Some even come in at, at two years and 11 months old. We also have 163 pre-K four classrooms and 68 mixed age classrooms. These classrooms include a balance of three-year-olds and four-year-olds together in the same room. And we also have a number of special education classrooms that have lower teacher to child ratios and that offer specialized programming. Our student population is also very diverse. It very much reflects um, the diversity across our city uh, with students that come from more than 100 different countries and who speak more than 100 different languages. And keep going. In terms of some specialized programming, at six of our elementary schools, and you can see those six schools on the screen, we offer Head Start programming to eligible pre-K families. Um, the Head Start program provides additional comprehensive services, like such as case management to help families work through challenges they might be having, parenting support, um, health promotion activities, and mental health supports as well. To families who qualify for the Head Start program, those are families who are experiencing homelessness, who may be eligible for TANF or the Supplemental Food Nutrition Program, um, who are, who, or who are foster, parenting a foster child. Um, our Head Start classrooms in many ways look very much like our general pre-K classrooms. They follow the same curriculum, um, same teacher requirements, all of those kinds of things, but they do offer additional comprehensive services like the ones that I mentioned. They also have some additional funding available to pay for things like field trips, um, additional classroom uh, materials, and supplies and these programs are also staffed with additional social work staff who can provide counseling uh, to kids and families, provide additional parent education activities, that type of thing. Um, Head Start schools very much encourage parent involvement and parent leadership. And so they offer lots of, of opportunities for parents to become involved, um, like a parent council that helps make decisions um, for the Head Start program. We can go to the next one. So we'll talk a lot tonight for the rest of our time together about our amazing educators in our pre-K classrooms. We're very proud of our teachers um, and the work that they do every day on behalf of children and families. Our teachers are highly trained uh, with expertise in early childhood development and learning. Um, unlike a lot of other pre-K programs across DC and across the nation, our teachers are fully certified and have at least a bachelor's degree in early childhood education or a related field. So they really are highly, highly specialized and highly trained. Many have advanced degrees, uh, master's degrees and doctoral degrees as well. Um, so they really do understand early childhood development, early childhood instruction um, and, and, and how to set up classroom environments in a way that makes our littlest, littlest people thrive and learn. Um, also our assistant teachers have an associate's degree. So every classroom is staffed not only with a teacher but also an assistant teacher. And that assistant teacher has either an associate's degree or equivalent 48 hours um, in college credit. 
Um, and our teaching staff, both our teachers and our assistant teachers receive ongoing training and support. We have a, a, a pretty large team of instructional coaches um, who support our teachers, provide professional development, training, coaching, that type of thing to support them in providing excellent instruction for their students. And with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Robin. All right, great, thank you, Cheryl. So let's talk a little bit about what's happening in each of our classrooms. So at DCPS, our pre-K classrooms remain small. In our pre-K three classrooms, you'll never have, we'll never have more than 16 students. And our in-person pre-K four classrooms, you'll never have more than 20. That really allows our teachers to get to know each child and provide a great deal of individualized instruction and attention to each child. Um, in our self-contained special education classrooms, they're all capped at 12 students with at least two adults supporting. Again, really allowing opportunities for that one-on-one -on -one and building those relationships. We can go ahead to the next slide. Thank you. So one of the most important things to know about our program is that we believe about what is what we believe about how young children learn and what their school experiences should feel like. At DCPS, we believe that all young children are capable and competent learners and their voices and their ideas are welcomed and valued and highlighted in the classroom. We believe that children thrive in environments in which they feel safe and welcomed, loved and valued. Again, going back to really focusing on their voices and their ideas and lifting those up. We care about he, how each child, including your child, is learning, but we also really care about how they feel at school, how your child feels at school. We want all of our young learners to know that they are important and that they are valued in our classroom and that they are safe and loved in our classroom. I'm so sorry. Um, so in our classrooms, children learn through a combination of intentional play, teacher led lessons and joyful learning experiences. Our approach to learning is based on years of research about how young children learn best. And that research shows that young children really learn through active hands-on experiences that include a balance of child-directed play and intentionally, intentional teaching teacher-led activities. So based on this research and listening to teachers and listening to families, our classrooms follow a project-based approach which help children learn through fun, hands-on experiences. Again, taking children's ideas about what the studies are and really following those. Our teachers design learning experiences that focus on promoting children's language, literacy, math, social emotional development and creativity. All of this is really housed in joyful activities to prepare them for kindergarten and beyond. Thinking about how we design our classrooms and how our teachers are supporting learning, you may notice that I've mentioned the word joyful a couple of times. That's because we recognize that joy should be a big part of every child's experience in our schools. So what about the day? Here on this slide, you'll get a sense of what the daily schedule looks like in our pre-K classroom. You'll see lots of opportunities throughout the day for teachers to lead lessons and to facilitate a variety of learning experiences and activities. Each day, children participate in targeted small group lessons that allows teachers to provide specific and individualized instruction on specific skills using the data that we know about each child. You'll also notice there are read alouds, there are whole group meetings, building that community, and they have opportunity for outdoor play, um, weather permitting. So then we also have breakfast and lunch is eaten in the classroom and what we call a family style lunch because it's an opportunity for children to really engage in like casual relaxing conversation with their teachers and friends while they eat. Teachers use this meal time as a learning time and they use this conversation as a way to promote children's language skills and thinking. Recognizing as you look at the schedule, recognizing that our pre-K students are still very young and often become tired about midday, we have the opportunity to rest and nap after lunch. Those students who do not need to sleep are provided with quiet activities to work with during this time, just a time to quiet their minds and their bodies and get ready for the rest of the day. And some of those activities that we do on nap at, during nap time for those that aren't ready to nap are reading books or working on puzzles or doing something very quiet, but again, relaxing. Next slide, thank you. 
Um, one time of the day that we really want to highlight and focus on with, with this group is our center time, our learning time, our learning centers. Our pre-K class, classrooms are carefully designed to support the active hands-on play and learning that, we, that I've described in the previous slides. Each pre-K classroom includes a variety of learning centers or interest areas. Um, some of them are included on this slide. You can see science and discovery blocks, water and sand tables, dramatic play, library and listening areas, art, technology, toys and games. Some schools have music centers in there. Um, so each day children are able to choose which center they would like to play in. And in those centers, they direct their own play and their own learning. The teacher and the assistant teacher work and play with them in the centers, kind of asking questions and incorporating learning into play and pushing their play into more complex play. Teachers are frequently adding new materials into the centers to provide children with new experiences and to keep them interested and engaged. Teachers also frequently lead small group lessons while other children are working and playing in centers um, under the supervision of the assistant teachers. The classroom, this is a little bit more about the, those learning or interest areas. The classroom learning centers, um, while our, the key point is for, for play and for children to really engage in play, they're also designed to encourage uh, children's um, learning and critical thinking and cognitive development. So this slide just talks a little bit about examples of some of those skills that are developed in the learning centers. For example, in blocks, you have the math skills as you're talking about the different sizes of blocks and how to build them and spatial skills, problem solving, how do you do build the tallest, the most stable step, the tower, um, social skills as they're uh, engaging in navigating play and sharing of those blocks. All that's ha happening in math, in, in the blocks area. The dramatic play, they're bu building language skills, literacy skills as they're in a restaurant and they're taking people's orders and they're deciding who's going to cook and who's gonna be the customer and all that creative thinking of how do you turn the food we have here into the food you wanna serve, all of that. So. While children are engaged in place, it's also an opportunity to build a lot of those skills. And we really wanna support that in having those joyful moments. I'm gonna now turn it over to Lauren. Thanks Robin. So you'll see in addition to the classroom programming that Robin just discussed, we also have a wide range of comprehensive services for children, teachers, and families to round out the whole early childhood experience. Um, as you'll see here, we offer specialized services like speech therapy, occupational therapy, special education services, and mental health supports. Additionally, all of our pre-K students participate in art classes, music class, and physical education. And in many of our schools, we also have social service supports that are available to families who can benefit from you know, case management, goal setting, um, crisis intervention. It's not just your little ones who are starting school, but we really love to take a whole family approach. Um, as, and we really like to you know, support the whole family through this transition um, into pre-K. And then as you um, go into K and, and upper grades, really trying to set, set the stage here. At the start of the presentation, um, we mentioned that many of the best pre-K classrooms um, in the DC region can be found at, at DC public schools in particular. One of the reasons for this is the support that we provide our teachers. Our pre-K teachers receive ongoing training and professional development opportunities, uh, coaching, and to help them continue to learn um, new skills and improve their current practice. Our teachers are constantly learning um, more and perfecting their work so that they can create the best possible learning environments for your kiddos. And finally, we've talked uh, quite a bit about play um, and learning through fun activities, but we also want to assure you that your children are learning while they're having fun. And they leave our pre-K classrooms ready for success in kindergarten and of course beyond. Based on our pre-K assessments, more than 92% of our pre-K students are meeting or exceeding developmental expectations. 
and children who enroll in DCPS pre-K programs outperform national literacy averages upon kindergarten entry. Okay, so let's take um, a little bit of a pause and pull some questions. So you can feel free to add some in the chat or come off mute if you'd like. Um, and then I also have some questions that many of you submitted in advance. Let's start with you know one that folks submitted early, which is what's the right school for my toddler? Should I prioritize the school or the location? Anyone wanna, wanna take that one? I would say this is not going to be a very helpful answer, a little bit of both. And so we know that convenience is really important, um, especially when you have little children and might be rushing off to work or something like that. Um, important to, to find a school that's going to work for you and your family. Attendance is really important. And we really encourage pre-kindergartners to come every day. And that's harder to do if you've chosen a school that's just not convenient for you. So I would say definitely convenience is a factor. Um, but the, the programming is also a factor as well. As Robin and, and Lauren mentioned, most of our schools are following the same curriculum. They're following the same um, study units that, they're, that the kids are experiencing during the day. Um, so there won't be a lot of difference in terms of the curriculum experiences with the exception of some programs that are dual language or Montessori or something like that. Other than those, um, it's a very similar curriculum experience. Uh, but I encourage you to go ahead, go to open houses, reach out to the school principal, find out when those open houses are. Um, usually you can visit uh, the classrooms and do a walkthrough and you can really get a feel for what that, that school community is like as well as you make your decision. Um, anybody else have anything to add to that question? I think you covered it, Cheryl. And then there's a question just about the ratios. Would you mind repeating that for pre-K three, four and then the mixed age? Sure, so pre-K three uh, is no more than 16. All of the classrooms have two adults, so that's true no matter what. Um, Pre-K three uh, maxes out at 16 students. Um, Pre-K four can't well, goes up to 20, we'll never have any more than 20 students. And a mixed age can go up to 17. We'll not have any more than 17. Thank you, and then I'm gonna do one more question and um, then there's some really specific lottery questions that we're about to transition into. The, the practical matters that I know everyone um, is really are really eager for. But one question about um, potty training. Do students have to be potty trained? That's a very good question. No, they do not. We welcome all three and four year olds regardless of their toilet training status. Um, and what we do for children who, who are not, who are in the process of toilet learning, but maybe not fully independent yet, the teacher will work with you on that. So learn what types of strategies you're using at home so that they can try to try to use some um, very similar strategies at school. So it really is approached as a partnership. So we will support um, support your little ones in learning that process. We know that through, especially in our three-year-old classroom, but even in our four-year-old classroom, kids have accidents. That's just, that, that just happens and that's totally fine. So your teacher will ask you to bring in um, at least one spare set of clothes just in case. Um, and our classrooms do have, have pull-ups on hand and the other materials that they need to support toilet learning in the classroom as well. Thank you, Cheryl. And so um, without further ado, the real star of this evening's presentation, just want to bring up uh, Lauren Brooks again, who's going to get into the nitty gritty of the lottery. Lauren. Thank you so much, LB2. Um, and again, happy to be here with you all. Um, so I'm going to jump right in into everything about my school DC lottery. First, kicking it off with some top FAQs that we receive. Uh, from families that are looking for especially uh, ECE. So how do I know if my child is eligible for pre-K? Well, for one, you must be a DC resident. So that is first and foremost. And we do have age minimum regulations for all of our ECE grades. So for pre-K three, all students must be three years old by September 30th of 2023. For pre-K four, they must be four years old by that same date, September 30th of 2023. And for kindergarten, they must be five by that date. That is a hard deadline for all of our students. Unfortunately, if your child does not meet that date of birth, and I can definitely empathize, I am in the middle of birthday, um, they would have to wait into the next upcoming school year to enroll. Um, or, you know, if they, you know, for instance, are turning three, turning four, after that date, they can still be eligible for pre-K three. 
same deal, they're turning five. After that date, they will be eligible for pre-K four and so on. Um, and then who needs to apply? Well, again, the pre-K um, lottery is required. The lottery is required for all pre-K families, regardless if you are in boundary or out of boundary. So families within DCPS do not receive the right to attend school until they are compulsory age and compulsory grades begin at kindergarten. So prior to kindergarten, all students, that is again, in boundary schools, out of boundary schools, citywide schools, and this also includes public charter schools, which are not affiliated with DCPS, all are required to submit the My School DC lottery application. And the lottery application is found on the myschooldc.org website. Um, we will get into key dates shortly, but the lottery did open this past Monday. Um, just as a heads up, it is not a first come first serve lottery. So you do not have to have submitted your application on Monday for your chances to be better. You can submit your application throughout the entire period that the lottery was open in order for your child to be eligible for a match or you know, a waitlist offer from a school. Uh, next slide. So again, navigating through the My School DC lottery is very uh, fairly simple. You would visit the myschooldc.org website. You are um, able to explore pre-K options via using the school finder. Um, in a bit, I will also drop in the enroll um, dcps.dc.gov website where you can find information specifically on our DC public schools. Um, the application again is available online only, so you must submit it via the online app. Um, it can be submitted via English or Spanish. And there is a My School DC hotline team that is available Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. to answer any questions you have regarding technical difficulties or issues you're having with the application itself. Um, I do wanna also note that um, we are also available to assist you via you know, DCPS enrollment team. So if you have questions about DC public schools, you can always contact us as well. Uh, next slide. All right. And again, when applying to the lottery, you have the option to apply up to 12 schools that interest you. It is um, advised that you rank the schools in the exact uh, preferential order that you would like your child to attend. So that way, if you do not get, you know, matched with your first option, the hope is that, you know, let's say you applied to seven schools in total and you matched with number five. As long as you rank your schools in preferential order, you will be, you know, waitlisted for options one through six in hopes that you get a waitlist offer later in the season from one of those schools that, again, you would have preferred over number seven. And again, the application did open this past Monday, December 12th, and the deadline is March 1st. So you have a pretty, a pretty big window to submit your lottery application. Again, it is not a first come first serve application. So if you have not submitted yet, you are not behind, you are, you know, you still have a lot of time to, you know, consider your option, options, um, visit open houses. I did drop in the link for DCPF open house dates. That is a real-time document that we will continue to update as more schools provide us with their open house dates, but please feel free to um, bookmark that page and, you know, definitely use that to determine where you will go in terms of, you know, identifying open houses that you would like to uh, attend so that way you can, you know, begin thinking about how to make this decision and what, you know, 12 schools, if you decide to apply up to 12 schools, which is not mandatory, but you have the option to, um, what those schools will be prior to March 1st. Uh, next slide. And then here are just some key dates for the current lottery season that we are in right now. I hope all of you um, had a chance to check us out on Saturday. All DC public schools that serve pre-K three through grades 12 were present at the 2022 My School DC EdFest, which is the annual public school fair. If you were on, you know, there were in the virtual world, there were some technical difficulties that were unfortunately out of our control, but we hope that you had an opportunity to meet with the schools that you wanted to visit to learn about them. And if you have you know, additional questions, please do not hesitate to reach directly to the schools and they will be happy to assist you. Um, we already discussed that the lottery would, that the lottery opened, excuse me, this past Monday. And if you have older kids, which I know this is geared towards um, ECE ages, but if you have older ones that are interested in high school, um, the deadline for our high schoolers is Wednesday, February 1st. And then a month later, Wednesday, March 1st, is our deadline for our pre-K three through eighth grade students. 
um, all lottery results for all students in the district, including public charter school students will be released on March 31st. And that is also the date that enrollment begins for DC public school students for the school year of 22, I'm sorry, 23, 24. And then if your student is fortunate enough to receive a match in the lottery, the deadline to secure that seat, which includes submitting your enrollment packet, all supporting documents and your proof of DC residency, that deadline will be Monday, May 1st, um, again, to ensure that you have secured that seat for the upcoming school year. Uh, next slide. And of course, I know we have some time for questions, but you can always, again, please visit the enrolldcps.dc.gov website or email us at enroll.k12.dc.gov. And I'm gonna drop in the chat um, in just a moment, this, both of these links so everyone can have access and you know, can definitely be able to contact us without any questions. So I guess I'm gonna swing it back to our friends at ECE. Or did you guys wanna lead the questions? How do we wanna, or did you want me just to go to the chat? Please let me know what you prefer. Absolutely. So we've got some questions in the chat mm -hmm. that we can pull as well. Let's see. I'm reading one that says, can you share a little bit more about in-boundary versus out-of-boundary lottery preferences? And you, can you speak more about the preferences for dual language um, pre-K-3 programs? Sure. So your in-boundary school is based on geographically where you live in the district. So that determines... Um, Again, what school is basically like your in, like your neighborhood school, your zone school, different cities call it different things. So not sure where you may be from, but some cities say neighborhood, some say zone, but it's just based on geographically where you live within the District of Columbia. To find your in-boundary schools, um, elementary, middle, and high school, you can check out this link that I just dropped in the chat um, where you can you know determine what schools your student has access to. Out of boundary schools would be any other school um, that is not your one identified elementary, middle, high school, and boundary school. So every other school in the district will be out of boundary for your student. Students are able to receive an in boundary preference for their in boundary school, which allows them better chances to get into a school over students that are out of boundary. And then in terms of preferences for dual language programs, um, they are similar to the preferences in all of our schools. The only difference is that um, siblings are weighted higher than in boundary at our dual language school. And again, that is under the impression that a family that has you know, one student learning in Spanish would likely want their other kids to also learn in Spanish. We wanna keep siblings together as much as we can. Um, still, of course, honoring that in boundary preference, but in those dual language schools, giving siblings more of an advantage because again, one sibling learning Spanish is going to be an advantage for their other sibling to learn Spanish as well. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. What other questions do we have? Um, okay, I see another one in the chat. As a follow-up, one of my priorities is dual language program. As my child speaks Spanish, there aren't many options in my neighborhood in Ward 5, um, so should I rank programs citywide? I'm sorry, can we, what, where was that question again? I'm sorry, Absolutely. lost lights in here. So I'm sorry, <laughs> in the office, so lights just went out. Hopefully someone is walking around and we'll shift them back on. Um, okay, Absolutely. I think I'm at the bottom. Um, yeah, this so this, this parent Phillip, right? is interested okay. in, um, in dual language programs um, as their child speaks Spanish. And so there aren't many options um, in their neighborhood in Word 5. So should, if they're interested in dual language, should they rate, rank programs that are citywide. Um, I guess in other words, should they prioritize um, programs that are dual language, regardless of whether or not they're in boundary, if that's what they're they're focused on. So, right, so the luxury of the lottery is that uh, you do not, you're not limited to schools in your ward, you know, you're in boundary school, you are able to apply to any school in the District of Columbia. So yes, we encourage you, to, you know, expand your options to, you know, places, of course, that would be within reason of thinking of, you know, morning commutes, evening commutes, but yes, you are able to look at any school in the district. Um, again, the lottery is required for all of our schools for all pre-K students. So yes, please do not limit yourself. You can apply to as many, you know, up to 12 schools. So that can be anywhere within the district that you, you know, are interested in for your child. Great. Thank you. All right. Looking back at the chat, um, we have a question that is, if you place five schools on your list for the lottery and your child is not matched with any of the schools selected, 
um, what would take place next? Or are students always matched with at least one of the schools from their list? So this is a great question. Um, with the lottery, a match is never guaranteed. You can get up to one match, but it is never guaranteed that you will get a match. In the instance that your child does not match with any school, you are, you know, able to wait, you know, to see how the waitlist movement goes for the schools where you're waitlisted. Hopefully you get a good enough waitlist number that you'll get a call from a school. You can also go back into your application and update it with new schools um, that may have better chances of you, you know, getting a chance to enroll into by adding those schools to your application and hoping to get a waitlist number. I'm sorry, getting a waitlist offer from one of those schools at that time. Great, thanks, Lauren. Um, another question that we have is after you find out your lottery number, can you adjust your preference list? Um, so I'm wondering if this speaks to, if you can adjust um, like your preferences prior to submitting or prior to the deadline, or if they're wondering about after the fact. Okay, so if I'm understanding this correctly, if you, let's say you apply to a school I'm sorry, you apply to all of your schools and then move, let's say, move into a certain um, area where you now get in boundary preference. Yes, you can go back and you can request that in boundary preference be added to your child's application, which would then um, increase their chances. Or let's say you have a compulsory grade K and above student that becomes enrolled. You can go back and then update your application to then request sibling preference. So you can request sibling preferences based on your circumstance as they may change throughout the season. Great, thank you. And I think, and also just to remind parents too that until the lottery deadline, um, say you select 12 schools and you list them um, in there, you can go back and you can reorder them and change them at any time until the deadline, correct? Yes, that is correct. Great. Um, let's see, um, a question. It's also Actually, one about the feeder pattern, which might be a, yeah. one, a good one for Lauren as well. Lauren, that question is what's the beta, best way to figure out which pre-K three schools feed into which upper level schools? Right, so currently we only have two schools that only serve pre-K. Um, which are Military Road Early Learning Center and Stevens Early Learning Center. The rest of our schools that serve pre-K students all are a part of an elementary school or an education campus. So they automatically feed directly into kindergarten. Um, but to see you know, our school's feeder pattern, I am dropping a link in the uh, chat that shows, oops, hold on one second, apologies. Um, I accidentally sent that thing to one person instead of everyone. <laughs> they dropped it again. Um, I don't know how that happened. Um, but yes, you can see um, all of our feeder patterns from elementary to middle to high school. And then I do see another question. Unfortunately, if they turn three on October 1, the September 30th is a hard deadline. Absolutely. Just giving it a minute to see if we've got any other questions in the chat. Also participants, if it's easier for you to, to unmute to ask your questions, you are welcome to do so. We'll drop some links in the chat. No, there must be more. <laughs> I feel like there's always so many questions. Um, what is the required um, for proof of re residency? Does it require um, both parents or can only one parent reside in the district or um, in a specific ward? How does that work? Yes, yeah, so we have um, residency proof documents on our website. Um, I will drop that in the chat for everyone to review at their leisure. Um, both parents are not required to be DC residents, only at least one parent needs to be a resident, and that is the parent that would be required to, um, you know, enroll the student, you know, to support, support that they are a current DC resident, I'm sorry, living with a DC resident. I'm just going to drop in the chat um, the link from my website, which gives more information on proven DC residency. I'll drop that shortly. 
Absolutely. There was a question that um, somebody had submitted ahead of time that was asking about busing. Um, and is busing provided if you don't attend your neighborhood school? Um, and I think I can answer this. Chime in if I'm answering this incorrectly. But I believe the only busing that we provide is for students who um, have been identified to have an IEP um, and maybe need to transition to a, to a school that's not in their neighborhood. Is that correct? That's accurate. Yep. Yeah, that's right. also my understanding as well. Right. Question in the chat. Once your child reaches kindergarten, um, they're guaranteed enrollment in their in-boundary school, correct? That is correct. Yes. All students are considered compulsory once they get to kindergarten. And there was one question that popped up right before that, um, which is about what proportion of students entered the pre-K-3 lottery last year and didn't get a match. Do we have that data? We have data on the um, enrollment website, so I will drop the link to our lottery results page where you can definitely view that at your leisure as well. Wonderful. Just drop it in the chat for everyone. Perfect. And there is a question um, that was submitted earlier, just as a reminder to people, um, do we have to um, do the lottery every year? As long as you complete the terminal, I'm sorry, as long as you complete the end of the school year and are not looking to change your school, so you're just looking to re-enroll, um, a new application is not completed. An application is only completed if you are, you know, looking to enroll into a new school that is not your feeder pattern school, or if you break, you know, the fee, if you break your enrollment right by leaving the school, withdrawing, and are looking to return. Great. Thank you. Also, if you hear any background noise, I am still in the office, so apologies if there is background <laughs> noise. I'm not sure if you can hear it, but there's a little bit of a party going on behind me, so I'm so sorry. Not at all. I think <laughs> most people on this call um, have have kiddos or dogs or you know partners at home, so there's yes. there's always background noise. We welcome it. There's yes, yes, yes. Lives outside of this. Um, let's see. Are there any more questions in the chat? I'm trying to. Scroll yeah, back there up. are a few, Drew. So. Um, this person says, do I understand correctly that there's no guarantee that a student is offered a spot in a pre-K program, even their local or neighborhood school? That is correct. Yes. And this person says, during my call around to different schools, registrars were explaining to me that a lot of seats are filled due to wait listed from last year. Is that true most of the time, even if... Um, Go ahead, I'm even, sorry. <laughs> did you hear? I'm sorry. Do you want me to start over? No, no, you're good. You're good. Okay. Even um, now, I lost my. Uh, I got it. Yes. Yeah. Last year, even okay. if they're. <laughs> Thank you. Even oh, if they're, they're inbound school. Yes. So our wait lists are not. So I apologize for any miscommunication, but our wait lists are not um, preset from last year. All wait lists for the uh, 23 24 lottery will only be based on the application submitted in this season only. So I apologize for the miscommunication. Um, I don't know, you know, why that would have been shared, but that is incorrect. The waitlist is not, um, you know, ro rolled over from last year. No, it is not. Oh, that's Can really we, good to know. Uh, yeah, and someone just was curious in general, what is the waitlist process? Um, so the waitlist is used when all of the seats that are submitted in the lottery are not filled by matches. If there are additional seats available, the school will leverage the waitlist until they are, you know, have a full roster. Robin, there was a question in the chat that you answered um, about inquiry and project-based learning. Do you want to raise that up for the good of the group? Yes. Um, the question was specifically about IB PYP programs, um, which is an inquiry-based approach um, that goes from pre-K through 12th grade. Um, and it was whether a majority of our programs are that, and that is not the case. We have, I believe, one or two programs that are actually certified in the IBPYP program, but all of our programs are inquiry based. So we're all, it's all based on children's study and, and um, investigating, and a lot of the same strategies and approaches are used in, in all programs. Thank you. Looking back through the chat to see if we've missed anything. Hi, can I ask a question? 
Of course. Can you hear me? I yeah. don't know if you can see me. Um, so um, in, in, in terms of the, um, hold on, sorry. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, I just can't think of my question now. Okay, let me come back. <laughs> no worries, we're on, <laughs> we're on. So if you think of it, come back on anytime. <laughs> And while we're at it, I see a couple more questions in the chat. Does somebody want to raise those up? I see them popping. Yep. Through. So a seat. So this is just, you know, clarifying, which is um, does getting a seat in an elementary school automatically set up the child to go into the feeder uh, middle or high school, even if it's out of boundary? And they just want to make sure that they're understanding that, which is correct. Yes, you are correct. As long as you do not withdraw your child and they complete the terminal grade for elementary they are able to follow that feeder pattern to middle. Then as long as you do not withdraw and you complete the terminal grade, which is eighth grade, you can proceed to the feeder high school as well. And then um, what are, so speaking, we've been talking, oh, I see, Michelle, you're back. Are you ready for us? Yes, I have okay, one more <laughs> question. So um, I was just at an open house. Um, it, it was the Capitol Hill Montessori and Prior to going to the open house, I looked up the like lottery um, statistics from the previous year. And I was asking them like, why does this seem incorrect? Because I know you guys are a popular school and are full, but according to the lottery, you guys had like 25 open seats and only filled 16 of them, which I know is not true. So it seems really off. And they were saying, yeah, those statistics are not accurate. Um, so are they really that off? Because I was hoping to use those statistics because my son is entering PK4 and I know it's a lot harder to get into those. So I know there's 12 schools I can rank, but I have to be cautious. Otherwise, he might end up like not going anywhere if I only rank schools that usually fill up. Does that make sense? Right. So not sure what that data you would have been reviewing would have been from. So apologies for any confusion, but I do... I um, encourage you to definitely check out the lottery results that are available online, which will give you accurate information. So I just put that in the chat for everyone. Um, we'll be able to see, you know, actual um, match the enrollment rate and then um, wait list offered to enrollment rates as well. Okay, it was the school specific site on DCPS. Okay, yes. Yeah, so this is going to be, I'm not sure what that would have been referencing, but this link is what you should definitely check out. This is our official lottery results from our data and strategy teams. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. And then we have a question. What um, are the factors that determine a match, the match? Okay. So every student receives a random lottery number, which is, um, again, is random and is provided by the algorithm that my school DC uses to determine lottery matches in um, students that are waitlisted. And simply with your random lottery number, according to, oh, along with the preferences that students are eligible for, um, as well as the number of seats that a school has available, that will determine if a student gets a match or a waitlist offer. So aren't really any factors, just, you know, if you have a preference, you are ranked higher than students without preferences. And again, the number of seats will determine how many students get a match based on the random lottery number. And from there, any additional students over the number of seats available um, that are, you know, allotted per grade, those students are waitlisted. Wonderful. And Lauren, just for the, for the good of the group, because I know most people are new to this, um, can you remind everybody what some of those possible preferences for pre-K might be, yes. starting with, you know, in-boundary and so on? Yes. So there's the in-boundary preference, again, for students that live in-boundary for the school they are applying to. We also have sibling preference. Um, you can qualify for sibling attending if your student, if you have another student that is currently in the same school you are applying to. That student must also be planning to re-enroll, so they cannot be in a terminal grade. So you cannot have a student that is currently in fifth grade that will be going to sixth grade next year, and you are applying for a pre-K three or four seat and trying to get a preference based on that outgoing fifth grader. They must be enrolled at the same time, and they must um, reside in the same household with the parent or guardian that is enrolling both students. So both students, like, you know, some Families share custody, so one student cannot live with mom, the other lives with dad. They have to be in the same household, both attending the school at the same time, 
um, in order to be eligible. And then similarly to the student, the sibling attending, we have sibling offered. So that's the instance where we have twins or maybe triplets. Um, our goal is to always keep siblings together. So it's one sibling, um, one twin or one triplet gets a match or waitlist offer. Um, the other twins or you know triplets will be bumped up on the waitlist to try to keep them together. Um, then we have proximity, which is very rarely seen. Um, that is where your inboundary school is more than half a mile from your home. And there is another DC public school that is within um, less than half a mile from your home. You would get a proximity preference because that school was not identified as your inboundary school. Um, that is very rare that we see that because in almost most, you know, most if not, you know, majority of our cases, that school would already be identified as your inboundary school. And then lastly, we have um, our 16 early action schools. Um, those are schools at which if your student is in boundary and they apply by the lottery deadline of March 1, if they do not get a match elsewhere, they are guaranteed a match with this school based on the fact that they are in boundary to um, this school. All right, any other burning questions about the lottery or um, any of the pre-K programming in general? I know it's a lot to, to absorb, so don't worry. We will we'll definitely be, um, both we will post the recording of this session. We'll also post um, some, you know, some additional handouts and information in the newsletter that you'll get following this. Um, and then we'll also host the session again in January. Oh my goodness, so sweet. <laughs> I wanted to see if anyone else had a question, but if there's time for one more question, I have one. Absolutely. Um, so I was wondering if um, DCPS um, uh, does training for its teachers on um, like interrupting microaggressions um, and, you know, racism that our children might experience in schools or if it's more school to school dependent? It's a very good question. You want me to take that team? Happy to take that. The answer is yes. And so we have been doing a lot of things for a number of years now um, on what anti-racism looks like, what microaggressions are, looking at implicit bias and that type of thing, um, and supporting teachers in addressing it. Our team has also been talking a lot lately about um, what does that look like specifically at the pre-K level? So the training that has been done thus, thus far has been district-wide and all teachers across the agency have participated in that. Um, and so we're now looking at how we can take that training and build on it as the next step in looking at specifically working with our pre-K teachers. So that work that's specific to pre-K has not happened yet, but we're looking forward to, to embarking on that soon. I think, Robin, if you're still on, um, do you wanna talk a little bit about the, the anti-bias work that your team has already begun with pre-K teachers? Yeah, so the ECE programs are committed to um, an anti-bias education approach focused on four goals, um, affirming identity, celebrating diversity, working with justice, and action, taking action. Those are the four goals of the anti-bias education. And this year, we've really been focusing our PD and our um, professional learning communities on affirming identities in the classroom. So that looks like uh, teachers have done um, some self-reflection and self-assessments and identified goals and conversations with coaches are all really focused on affirming identities and celebrating diversities in the classroom. And then next year, our focus will be on recognizing justice and injustice. I think, isn't there, so that one parent asks their diversity present preference, isn't there some, um, uh, uh, like people can do like siblings preference or in boundary, but isn't there also something for people in zip codes um, that are like lower income to get preference at some schools? Is that, I forget what it's called. There, so is, there is, a, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Lauren, you got it. Like, there is a preference at um, charter schools, which is the um, equitable access preference. 
what, what DCPS offers is a set aside um, amount of lottery seats, which is our equitable access designated seat. So it's not a preference. If you meet um, any of the qualifications for the equitable access designated seats, you can apply and be placed into that specific lottery, but it is not a set aside preference. So that is the difference. It is a preference for charter schools, but not for DC public schools. You have to um, be experiencing one of the following, um, homelessness, receiving TANF, um, SNAP, or one of the um, identified, you know, government assistance uh, benefits to be eligible for that to apply for those seats. But it is not a preference. It is simply a, um, a you know, allotted amount of seats in these specific schools, which we recently dropped into the chat, um, that families can be eligible for. Your little one's adorable, by the way. Thank <laughs> you for sharing. <laughs> Made me smile. So sweet. <laughs> she was <laughs> upset that she wasn't in the picture, so <laughs> oh, she's just her. beautiful. I can relate. I'm <laughs> listening to mine and looking at yours. <laughs> um, but thank you for that question. Um, and, and that which, you know, gave us an opportunity to highlight some of the work that we're doing um, around said topics. And so it looks like we are rounding the bases home. Um, I just want to highlight a, a little bit more here, which is, um, you know, we're just so appreciative of everybody joining us, your really thoughtful questions. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us with more. Um, we're happy to help. We'd really appreciate your feedback as well. So if you could take a moment to fill out the survey, there's a link in the chat, um, or you can, you know, put your phone up to the QR code. Not only does your feedback help to inform our sessions, but by just um, by filling out the, the survey, excuse me, you'll be entered into a drawing to receive a bundle of children's books that will be mailed to your home. So please, please, please fill that out. Um, we are, again, so thankful for your participation and Lauren, as always, for your partnership and expertise. You make us all look great. Have a good evening, everybody. Have a good one, everyone. Thanks for joining us.